All right, students, welcome back to Dante's The Divine Comedy 2019 special lecture 17A review of the entire Inferno. So we're going to be going very general and very quickly through the entirety of the first nine, uh, the first nine circles, all nine circles of Dante's Inferno. So I'm going to go slide by slide very quickly, say a couple things, but I have to move uh, between slides every 30 seconds or so. So remember, the three was a holy number to Dante suggesting the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity is the idea of Dante's medieval Catholic God. Remember, there are three canticles in his work, the Divine Comedy. They are the Inferno, which is a funnel, the Purgatorio, which was created in the same event, which is a mountain, and the Paradiso. Recall, each one of the sections of the Divine Comedy is called a canticle. Therefore, there are three canticles in the entirety of the Divine Comedy. Comedy, and remember their names, Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso, or in English, uh, uh, Hell, also called Inferno, Purgatory, and Paradise, also called Heaven. All right, very good. Just giving you these numbers now. So some of the mechanical parts of the poem that you need to know. Each section, each canticle, has at least 33 cantos. We'll call it the Inferno has 34 cantos because it also has one additional introductory Canto, where we find Dante in a dark wood. Remember that canto means song. And so this is a poem, and therefore the idea is that it is spoken out loud, that it is like a song, like the original poems, the original epic poems sung by Homer, Iliad, and Odyssey. So notice, because there are 33 cantos per canticle plus one additional uh, beginning introductory one in the Inferno, there are 100 total cantos across the three canticles of the one divine comedy. Now, remember... Three is a big number, and you need to know several iterations of three here. Uh, there are three major divisions of sin, and uh, circles two through five, those are the sins of incontinence, bodily sin, sins of the appetite. Cir circle seven, one, two, and three, remember circle seven is split into three subcircles, we'll talk about that later. Those are the sins of brutishness or violence. And then the third so sort of sin, the worst sort of sin, the deepest, darkest and a coldest sin is malice. We see that in 8 and 9, simple fraud and complex fraud. Remember the difference between simple fraud and complex fraud? So that simple fraud is when you defraud or lie to or are dishonest to someone you don't know, don't have a personal relationship with. Whereas complex fraud is when you betray someone who you do have a relationship with. Your rightful lord, your family member, uh, your, your guest, uh, or um, your, mm, uh, somebody that you have a political association with, Antonora. In any case... Remember also that the three-line poetic structure is called terza rima. The type of rhyme scheme used here is triple rhyme. We've gone through and seen that uh, each rhyme, except for at the very beginning and end of the canto, has a, or the last word in each line will rhyme three times. In any case, the stanzas, remember that a stanza in poetry is the paragraph in poetry. Paragraphs for prose, uh, stanzas for poetry, they're called terzets. There are three lines, and that there, there are three animals that we run into in the first two cantos, a lion, a leopard, and a she-wolf, and they correspond to the three major divisions of sin, incontinence, brutishness, and malice. All right, here are a couple pictures. Here's the lion that we see after the leopard. Here's the she-wolf, not looking as intimidating as we would hope, but sort of reminding us of Lupin from Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. There's the dark wood that Dante first finds himself in. Here's him looking at stars. You'll see this image again tomorrow. Uh... And there's Beatrice sending Virgil down to him. Recall that it was the fact that in the first two cantos, Virgil comes to see Dante. He says that he has been sent by a holy lady, a holy lady named Beatrice, to help Dante get through this difficult time and perhaps to see her again. We will see her again at the top of Purgatory. All right. We descend to the vestibule, the gate of hell. Recall that there are neutral angels outside of the vestibule of hell there uh, and also, good. Here's a picture of Charon. Here's Limbo. Okay, good, good, good. All right, so we get into hell, past the neutral angels. We get into a place called Limbo. Limbo is the first circle. It is for unbaptized and virtuous pagans who are hopeless with eternal desire, forever separated from God. Remember that there is a place in there called the Noble Castle, and that Noble Castle are the best philosophers, mathematicians, poets ever to have existed from the pagan tradition. It's sort of like an impotent Garden of Eden. In any case, the poets you really need to know are the ones that welcome Dante into their ranks. Their names are Virgil, Homer, or let's, don't even look at Virgil. Obviously, you know Virgil. Homer, Horace, Ovid, and Lucan, the philosophers you need to know are Socrates. Socrates was the pug-nosed teacher of Plato. Plato was the teacher of Aristotle, and Aristotle was, just so that you know, the teacher of Alexander 
the great. All right, there are the poets in limbo. They're talking to Dante. They look very happy. For those of you listening to the recording, the images that I'm referring to are largely Gustav Dore. Uh, a couple of them will be William Blake. All right, we then see Minos recalled that he has a serpent tail now, and with that serpent tail, he casts down souls to circles two through nine. So let's get to two. In circle two, we see the lustful, buffeted by winds, just as they are buffeted and out of control of their bodies because of their passions in life. The two lustful people that we meet down here are Francesca and Paolo. Remember this theme. The theme that you see two sinners, and one of them speaks for the two. Francesca and Paolo, Ulysses and Diomedes, Farinata and Cavalcanti, though both of them speak, they don't recognize each other's existence. And then, of course, the last time, Archbishop Ruggieri and Count Ugolino. Pairs of sinners with one speaking for the other. In this case, we know, obviously, it was Francesca who spoke. Remember that she and her lover Paolo, while reading a story about Lancelot cheating with Guinevere on Arthur, they met, they blushed, they, or their eyes met, they blushed, they kissed, they get caught in the act by uh, Jean Coteau. John the Lane is supposedly what that means. Sorry. Uh, John the Lane, not as in like his character, but like he, like Hephaestus, had a lame leg. And uh, he caught them, he killed them, and now he's in a deeper circle of hell than they are. And, well, unfortunately, we have to move on. Remember also Dido, Cleopatra, Helen, and Anthony, uh, Mark, Anthony, and Achilles are down here. I always think it's interesting that Achilles is here rather than amongst the wrathful. You can tell that Dante, obviously, had not read the Iliad. In any case, Dante, remember, swoons after hearing this story. Circle three. Not much to know about circle three except for it is one of the first circles protected by some monster or god. That monster is Cerberus. It has three heads. It is the guard dog of the underworld. One of uh, Heracles' tasks was to take Cerberus back to the world. You saw Cerberus also in the Aeneid. Remember, there are gluttons here in Circle 3. Those are people that overindulge in food and drink. Here's an image of gluttons, or excuse me, of Cerberus by William Blake. Very terrifying, very interesting. Good. And remember also Shiaco. Shiaco is the man whose name means pig in medieval Italian. He is the one that tells us about Florentine politics and about the four blackest sinners in hell that all happen to be Florentines. Remember that they are Tagayo Aldebrandi, Jacopo Rusticucci, this guy named Mosca, who we didn't really focus on in Canto 28, as well as Ferry Nata. All right. Good, 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 good. Circle four. Circle four, we run into another guardian of the circle. This guardian is Plutus. Plutus means money in Greek. Remember Plutocracy, ruled by the wealthy. He says, Pape Satan, Pape Satan, Alape, which prefigures not only Nimrod and his babble, bobbledygook language, but also Satan and his inability to speak. Things are getting unintelligible. In any case, in circle four, we run into a dual sin. It is called avarice and prodigality. Avarice is greed. Prodigality is overspending. So one, you're too tight-fisted. One, you're too open-handed with what you do. Recall that the avaricious and the prodigal push great heavy weights together, crashing them time and time again. This is what they're doing. It's very much reminiscent to us of Sisyphus and what Sisyphus did in uh, uh, the ancient Greek mythology, but also specifically in Virgil's Aeneid and also in Homer's Odyssey. We had an account of Sisyphus in both of those. All right, here's another picture of them pointlessly, impotently moving these stones along the same track, never gaining each other's perspective, never realizing that they're all two sides of the same coin, essentially speaking. Remember also that Virgil gives a discourse on fortune, fortune, chance, will, destiny, big concepts in the Divine Comedy. Do you make your own choices? Can you change change your destiny? Has God already written out a plan where your choices do not matter because they've already been made? Dante's opinion on this is, no, your choices do matter more than anything, which makes a lot of sense to me, but a lot of people that talk to Dante, Brunetta Latini included, will say, well, actually, everything's already written in the stars, so you can just do whatever you want because you're already going to do whatever it is that you're made to do, which might be true of an ant, probably not true of a human, though. You can make the wrong choice. In any case, the wrathful. We get to Circle 5. Remember, Circle 5 is where we run into our second river. The first river in hell is Styx. The second river in hell is... Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. The first river in hell is Acheron, and Charon <coughs> takes us across it. The second river in hell is Styx, the river of wrath. Phlegias takes us across it. The third river in hell is Phlegathon, boiling blood in seven, Circle 7, Sub-Circle 1, and the fourth circle, which is the entirety of Circle 9, is the Frozen River Coast Side. So just so that you know that, I said that. All right, in this Circle 5, we have our second double split sin. 
The same is wrath, which is extroverted anger, expressing your anger physically, and sullenness. To be sullen means to be resentful, to keep it inside, and so sullen are beneath the surface of the river sticks, and they're bubbling up, either yelling impotently or burning in anger down there. Depends on the account. In any case, one of the wrathful attempts to board the vessel that Phlegias is piloting while Virgil and Dante are going across this river. His name is Filippo Argenti. He says, disdainful soul, blah, 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 blah. And Dante <clears throat> looks at him with contempt. And Virgil actually uses an oar to knock him off. And then kisses Dante and says, that contempt was admirable. And something, again, one of those major themes that we see in the entirety of the Inferno is that Dante sometimes has the appropriate emotion or the emotion appropriate to the situation. He has disdain for this angry man. But sometimes he gets sucked in. Remember, he faints after listening to Francesca. So sometimes, and when he sees Boca, he kicks him in the head, perhaps by will, perhaps by destiny, perhaps by chance. But then at other times, he feels tremendous sympathy for these sinners. Virgil, you will recall, rebuked him once for that, saying, listen, you can't be feeling sympathy for these people. They're here for just reason. It's fair that they're here. You need to understand this, not just emotionally sympathize with this. In any case, we then run into the gate of Dis, which will take us, after we go through it, into Lower Hell, uh, circles 6 through 9, cantos uh, essentially 11 through 34. In any case, at this gate, we run into the fallen angels. They do not let Virgil through. Our confidence in Virgil then goes down. While we are waiting for Virgil to figure something out, a heavenly messenger starts to come down, but we don't see him. What we do see are three theories. Boom, they pop up. I actually got to lecture on them in the Iliad today, talking about how the Furies always, or how Iris tells Poseidon when Poseidon almost fights uh, Zeus in Book 15 of the Iliad, that the Furies always saw, or often side with the Elder. In any case, the Furies here, bless you, the Furies here say they are going to bring up Medusa, the Gorgon's head, to turn to stone Dante. Virgil puts his cloak in front of Dante's face. Dante, uh, and the Gorgon apparently doesn't come up. A heavenly messenger, an angel, comes down. He commands the gate to open. The gate does open, and Dante and Virgil go through. Good, 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 good. And all right, we pause for breath. <coughs> On to <coughs> circle six. You okay back there? Good, good. All right, circle six is uncategorized. It's heresy. What is unique about it, particular about it, peculiar about it? It is a Christian sin. A sin that could not be accounted for by the categorical system of Aristotle, because Aristotle, of course, was a pagan a Greek. And so the heretics here are trapped in flaming tombs. Two that we meet, one Guelph, one Ghibelline, are first the Ghibelline, Ferinata degli Uberti, second the Guelph, Cavalcanti de Cavalcanti. Recall that Cavalcanti was the father of Guido Cavalcanti, who was the best friend of Dante growing up. I believe I read a small poem to you. Uh, that was written by them together about wanting to go to a far-off land where they would never age and always love each other. Obviously, they did not because, well, both of them are dead now. But also, we know that Dante, unfortunately, was involved in the exiling of his friend Guido, who then died of, I believe it was malaria, that very same year. Very sad to thing to keep on his conscience. Second thing, remember that the other sorts of heretics down here are the Epicureans. The Epicureans were men who believed that the soul died with the body. So, if all you were going to do is die at the end of your life, and there's no afterlife where you're punished or rewarded, then you might as well live for sensual delight, and that is what they lived for. They were hedonists. They liked to drink, they liked food, they liked to live for the senses. <coughs> ah, yes. Something else to mention. We meet our first Pope down amongst the heretics, Pope Anastasius, and the reason why we see him is because Virgil and Dante actually hide behind his tomb because of the smell down there. Remember, the smell actually gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse the deeper you get into hell. It never stops getting worse until you start getting out of hell through a secret passageway underneath slash above Lucifer, depending on which hemisphere you happen to be in. All right, good, good, good. We said all of that. All right, good. Let's look at the schematic of the lower hell. Lower hell is technically... Circles 6 through 9, but even more technically, really, 7 through 9, since 6 is uncategorized. So, 7. 7 will be split into 3. Violence against others. That's where we'll see Phlegathon, the third river of hell, boiling blood. Circle 7.2. That's where the suicides are. Notice the very different terrain of all three of these. There's a boiling river for Circle 1, the violence against others. 
There's a forest with dogs running through it and ripping people apart and harpies in the trees, the trees of suicides um, in Subcircle 2, and uh, the violence against self, those who are both wastrels and those who are suicides. And then the violence against God, remember that there is a large desert plain that is burning hot with burning fire coming down on top of it, us. That's where we saw both Campanius and Brunetto Latini. So what do we need to know? From seven. Ah, yes, and also eight. I'll talk about this in a moment, but remember that eight is symbol fraud and it's split into ten bulges. We'll talk about that soon. Here's a picture of Phlegathon. Notice the boiling blood. Remember that the tyrants, as uh, remember, there are three types of center in circle seven, sub circle one tyrants, murderers, highway robbers. The more blood you spill, the higher you are immersed in blood <coughs> here. So the tyrants are up to their foreheads. One of the tyrants we ran into was Alexander the Great. Another Dionysus of, uh, I say Syracuse, but it might be Sicily. In any case, it was the student of Plato. You see here some centaurs shooting arrows at these blood-soaked sinners, boiling in blood. Uh, I think you also, is the Minotaur here? I don't see him, but I'll talk about him in a moment. All right. Now, remember, just as violence is a corruption of the rational soul, we have some creatures that are corruptions of pure humanity. They are bestial. They are abominations. They are admixtures of animal and man. They are the Minotaur, the Centaurs. We met Nessus, Pholus, and Chiron. Pholus is essentially like a, a, a minor version of Chiron in the same way that Theseus is like a minor version of Heracles or Hercules. And then also the Harpies. Good. We see the Minotaur and the Centaurs in the first subcircle. The Minotaur is sort of bellowing about. Virgil says, get away from here. He's, he's sort of the guardian of the area in the same way that Cerberus and Plutus are of circles three and four. And the harpies we, of course, run into horrifyingly with their faces of young ladies and their bird bodies and their feces on their chest, at least according to Virgil, in circle sub, or sub-circle two of circle seven. All right, good. Here's a picture of the harpies, the centaurs, and the minotaur, all the abominable combinatory creatures. In any case, who do you run into amongst the violent, among self? Run into Pierre de Lavinia. Peter of the Vine. Remember that he worked for the Emperor Frederick. The Emperor Frederick, who was the father of Manfred. Manfred, who was killed by father, or frater, not father, Alberigo, uh, at the feast when he said, let them have fruit, or bring the fruit, rather. Um, good. Remember that he committed his suicide, claimed that it was due to the special uh, vice of the court. He called it an inappropriate word, whore, but what he meant when he said that was envy. envy that which can catch uh, all people in a court. In any case, that's the man you need to know. Subcircle three of circle seven, we ran into Capanius. Remember this verb, he has fulminated, which means to be struck by lightning. <clears throat> we then hear about the origin of the rivers of hell in this giant statue in a place called Crete. It's called the Old Man of Crete. It's made of five different substances, gold, silver, bronze, or brass, uh, iron, and clay. Know those. Remember that one of his foot, his right foot, uh, one of his feet, his right foot, is made of Clay. Uh, remember also the rivers of hell. I said them once, I'll say them again. Acheron, Styx, Phlegathon, and Cocytus. And <clears throat> that's all I need to say here. Ah, yes. And, I, and also there's a yet a fifth river. It will not be in hell. It is a river that we have expected to see since the Aeneid. It is the river Lethe. It is the river of forgetfulness. It comes from the Greek word lanthano, to forget. In any case, we'll see that at the top of Purgatorio. Now, who do we see besides Capanius in Circle 7, Subcircle 3? Well, we see uh, Bernardo Latini, the former teacher of Dante. He says everything is subject to the stars and fate and fortune, essentially. He tells us to read his Il Tesoro, also called Le Tresor in French. Uh, tells us that he cannot stop because if he stops, he will have to uh, lay supine and burn for a hundred years. He denies agency. He acts like a good teacher, but he's not really a good teacher. You see here this picture of Gerion? I didn't notice until just now that actually Dante and Virgil are on it. It was always so interesting to me. I always just focus on the face of that Gerion. I think William Blake really just does a great job on this one. I mean, I look at the Gustav de Ray one, it's okay, but there's just something haunting about this one. I am defrauded by this picture. I mean, so much so, I don't even notice the sinners down below him. Did you? Oh, what? It's interesting, and that's part of fraud to to take one's eyes off what's important in order to focus on something else. And that's why he has garish swirls on his back. Garish swirls means bright colors that attract the eyes so you don't see the scorpion tail on the back that he uses to sting you. Uh, misdirection. 
is the word I was looking for earlier. This is the art of misdirection. That is the art of fraud. And that's why sorcerers, magicians, are down there. Now, remember, Darion is, I call him tripartite, but he's really sort of like quadpartite. He has the head of a just man, paws of a lion, body of a snake with uh, garish swirls about it, and uh, a tail of a scorpion. So he is himself an image of fraud because he has all these things that you can look at, and yet he has this very dangerous tip that you can't see that is swishing about in the dark abyss. Well, Dante and Virgil get on him, we're called it. Virgil gets between Dante and that tail, and that we said that that was sort of an allegory for good teaching in the same way that Dante or Virgil uh, puts his cloth between Dante's eyes and the Gorgon's eyes. There seems to be uh, part of education is revealing truths, but part of it is keeping somebody from the sting of certain truths. Uh, so Dante is being exposed to what fraud is logically without being actually <coughs> defrauded himself through experience. And that seems to be a good way to inoculate one against that. In any case, we spiral down. Circle 8, as I said, is divided into 10 ditches or pockets or bulges. The 10 pockets are these. The first one in Canto 18 is the only one, uh, is the only canto with two circles in it in circle eight, and that's where the panderers, the pimps, and the seducers are. Circle two, or excuse me, bulge two, the flatterers, bulge three, the simoniacs, bulge four, the future seers and sorcerers, or sorcerers, excuse me, sorcerers, good Italian there. Um, circle five, baritors, that's where we see the malabranche, hypocrites, that's where we see Caiaphas, uh, besides a bunch of monks, remember Caiaphas is horizontally being, uh, <clears throat> Um, um, what? Yeah, crucified. Thank you very much. Helping me with the, with the words. I'm bad with the words today. I have to say so much. And, uh, good. Circle seven, or, excuse me, bulge of seven, we find the thieves. They're being transformed with snakes. Remember Lucan. Remember Ovid. Dante, uh, explicitly competes against them. And remember Bonnie Fucci, the most arrogant man in hell, who flicks off God, no less. Then, circle 8.8. .8. Remember, that's where we meet Ulysses. Diomedes and Guido de Montefeltro. I guess I'll mention them in a moment. Then we see in uh, Bulge 9, the Swords of Discord, we'll see Ali and Muhammad and Bertrand aboard there. Then we see the Falsifiers in 10. That's where we find uh, there are four sorts of Falsifiers. One of the impersonators was Mira, who lay with her father. And then we see a counterfeiter and an alchemist. The counterfeiter is Master Adam. The, uh, uh, oh, excuse me. We see a counterfeiter and a liar. The liar is Sinon. We recall him from Book 2 of the Aeneid. Uh, we will then have giants, a giant, Antaeus, take, uh, take Virgil and Dante down to Cositus. Cositus is the frozen river, the fourth river of hell, where the ninth circle is, which is split into four. Four, Cana, Antonora, Ptolemaea, and Judeca. Cana, violent or traitorous to family. Antonora, traitorous to uh, country. Ptolemaea, traitorous to guest. And Judeca, traitorous to rightful Lord. All right, good. Here we are. Um, in Circle 8, the very first, or excuse me, in Canto, <laughs> in Canto 18, Circle 8, Sub-Circle 1, Bulge of 1, we find horned demons whipping the panders and seducers. Let's just go very quickly through this. The main person I need you to know from here is just a seducer. Name. His name was Jason. Remember that he lay both with Hippolyte, left her with child, and also Medea. I told that story to you. Uh, he, he did a lot of going around and leaving people pregnant and then leaving them alone without him. Very similar to Heracles, similar in a way to Achilleus, similar in a way to Odysseus. Very much a Greek type of hero thing to do. Perhaps not a heroic thing to do, according to Dante. Remember that the second bulge is full of flatterers. They are very uniquely encased in excrement. Ex excrement is feces or poo, to put it vulgarly. Remember there is a woman there who is a prostitute in Terence's play, the eunuch named Titus. I say Thais, not Thais, because the th sound is uh, a fairly unique sound. We don't know that the Greeks actually made that sound. In any case, the Simoniacs are in three. Remember that Simoniacs are named not for Simon Peter, the first pope, but for Simon Magus, who competed against Simon Peter in a magic contest, tried to fly, and then Peter crossed himself, prayed, and Simon fell out of the air. And so he lost. All right, this one's in an interesting thought. Font. In any case, remember that the future seers have their heads turned backwards just as they claim to be able to see the forward. Now they must forever look backwards. They're always crying too, so their tears actually go down there. But, sadly, uh, we saw the Barators. Barators are in Ditch 5. Also in Ditch 5, Cantos 21 and 22, are the Malabranche. Remember that the Malabranche are led by Malakota and that they attempt to trick and successfully trick Virgil. He only learns about this later from the hypocrites who cleverly say, I once heard that the devil was a liar. 
which I thought was very interesting. In any case, continuing to move on with the hypocrites. Remember that the hypocrites are mostly, uh, or the ones that we actually get to see are called the Frati Gualdenti, the Jolly Friars. They have very colorful cloaks on, which are actually leaden on the inside. So they look joyful and light and free. But they're actually very much weighed down by their own decisions. To be a hypocrite means to say one thing and to do another. It means there's a split between your words and your actions. And, and you know, it's very deep insult to give to somebody to call them a hypocrite uh, if you say so sincerely. In any case, seven thieves. Remember that we meet a unique, a very unique centaur here. His name is Cacus. He has a dragon on his back and he's amongst the thieves because he had once stolen cattle from Heracles. Heracles then tracked him down in his cave and uh, killed him. We learned that from the Aeneid. Also remember there are several Florentines here who uh, Dante will mention in Canto 26. Oh, be happy Florence. Where her name is known all throughout hell. And we see Vani Fucci here, who eventually gets attacked by a snake after flicking off God. Remember also how he speaks dishonestly. He speaks the truth in order to hurt Dante. He tells Dante about the success of the Ghibellines after, or excuse me, he tells Dante that his particular faction of the Guelphs will not do so well in the next couple years. Uh, it, is a, um, it is a veiled reference to Dante's uh, coming exile, in any case. Uh, circle, or excuse me, Circle 8, now Ditch 8, we find the Deceitful Counselors. As I told you, Diomedes and Ulysses are there. Again, that's one of those pairs of uh, sinners who are together with one who speaks. The one who speaks is not Diomedes, it is Ulysses, of course, the mo more eloquent of the two, the greater horn. He talks to Virgil, not to Dante. We said at least that, literally speaking, the reason for that is that Virgil spoke ancient Greek, Dante does not speak ancient Greek. Dante did not get to read Homer. Virgil did get to read Homer. We then saw Guido de Montefeltro. Remember that he's the one that has the drama at the end of his life. He was hired on by Pope Boniface VIII to help him with some military excursions after taking on the, uh, the robes of the Franciscans. He then agreed to be absolved of sin that he had not yet committed, which is a logical impossibility. And so a black cherubim at his death came to take him down to uh, hell, where he now is. Uh, nine. Bolgia nine. The schismatics. Remember here we have the two progenitor, progenitors of the Muslim faith. They are uh, Muhammad, who started the Muslim faith in the 7th century, uh, who Dante thought was a cardinal who wanted to be pope in the Catholic faith, who then uh, uh, schismat, or <coughs> created a schism, which would then become the nation of Islam. The son, or excuse me, son-in-law who married the daughter of Muhammad was named Ali. The daughter of Muhammad was Fatima. And because he was chosen to be successor, there was a divide created within the Muslim faith, which is still there today, between the Sunnis and the Shiites. We also see Bertrand of Bourne, who made a split between a father and his son, who was a king and a prince. He is carrying his own head. He is the first headless horseman sort of guy. All right, in 10, as I told you, we run into alchemists, impersonators, counterfeiters, liars. They are all falsifiers in some, in some way. Alchemy is falsification of metal. And, let's see, you don't need to know any more than that. Uh, impersonating is falsification of who you are. Counterfeiting is falsification of the value of the thing. And lying is falsification of the truth. Uh, of course, as I told you, Mira lay with her father in disguise. Therefore, she was a falsifier in the form of an impersonator. We also then met Pastor Adam, the counterfeiter, who tried to mix gold with dross and still pass it off as gold. As well as Sinon, who passed the falsity or lie off as the truth to the Trojans led the Trojan horse in, and led to the fall of Troy. It's almost like lies led to the destruction of Troy, Greek lies. And that is certainly how Virgil slash Dante, uh, being a descendant of Virgil in his own eyes, would perceive the situation. All right, recall the giants. We met the giants. They looked like towers. They pre prefigured same size, impotence, immobility, and voicelessness. The very particular ones that we met were Antaeus. He's the one who can move and speak. We also met, we didn't meet Briarius, remember that, he has 50 heads and 100 hands, and we think that's because Dante didn't get to read the Iliad, uh, the same reason he doesn't get to speak to um, Odysseus, because he neither read the Iliad or the Odyssey. I'll also remember Ephialtes and Otis. In any case, we move down to Cositus. Cositus is where we run into those last four, or excuse me, it is, Cositus itself is Circle 9 split into four different parts, Cana, Antonora, Ptolemaea, and Judeca. They are right there. Remember that Lucifer is at the bottom, mindlessly chewing and endlessly beating his wings. Because he beats his wings, that's what freezes Cositus. It, was, it does actually flow 
from the old man of Crete. How does it get frozen? Well, Lucifer, who is uh, just like the giants, um, shown from the waist up, is beating his six wings. He has six wings, three heads, and creating three winds, which are freezing the water and the blood and the tears that come out of his eyes and the blood that is running down his chin and face from the centers he is eternally chewing on. Yeah, good. All right, remember some of the characters we meet. Down in Cana, we meet Boca, and Dante supposedly kicks him either by accident, uh, which is chance, or by destiny, or by will. He can't tell what it was. I don't know why it happened, he says. All right, Boca refuses to name himself, but he's named by someone else. He, he's betrayed. We then meet Count Ugolino, Ruggieri, and Antonora. Remember the grisly story of Ruggieri betraying Count Ugolino after Ugolino had uh, betrayed his own family first in his life, and then later his grandson, Nino Visconti, in his life. Uh, and then, in the most grisly possible fashion, is locked in a place called the Tower of Hunger for several months, eight months, and then the door is locked, never to be opened. He ends up eating, supposedly, two of his sons, two of his grandsons, and is now forever, like Titius on Manalithus, uh, chewing on the head of the man who betrayed him, Ruggieri, Archbishop Ruggieri. There's also a, a secular sacred divide there, also a wealth ghibelline divide there. In any case, we then met Frater Alberigo, who I think I was calling out Beringo. Must be some uh, residual love of the Beatles there in me. Remember that he's the one that makes a dinner for a man that he claims to be at one with, uh, to no longer be at odds with after an insult. That man is Manfred. He is related to that man, Manfred. Manfred is a prince who is the son of the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, Frederick II. We will see Manfred in Canto Three of the Purgatorio with a small scar on his... Um, on his brow, the only thing disfiguring him. In any case, this man said, bring on the fruit, and then had these men who he claimed he was cool with killed. And so, very like Clytemester and Agamemnon, I said, now, quickly, last thing, Satan, we get to him. <coughs> He's covered in fur. He has six wings, like a seraphim, that's the highest choir of angel, which create three winds, and has three faces. One on the front is red, one, and then the two on the sides above the shoulders are black and yellow. The one in the front has a sacred traitor. His name is Judas. That's what Judeca is named for. Judas Iscariot is the one who uh, uh, betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, who was mentioned at the Last Supper. One of you will betray me. Now, the two other sinners, Brutus and Cassius, were secular traitors. They came about in order to defeat a secular king, not a sacred king like Jesus. That secular king was Julius Caesar. They conspired to have him killed on the uh, steps of the Senate. You can read about that in William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, you can read about that in Plutarch's um, Life of Julius Caesar from the 2nd century A.D. All right. That's it. That's our review session. We got through.